Hello and welcome to Business Finishing School. Let your business brain finish what your entrepreneurial heart started. Our catalyzing statement is a successful entrepreneur inside of every business. Enjoy this module. Welcome to module 10, the 5200% rule, how to consistently attract and hire talent. And I will say that this module is worth the price of the entire course times 10. I think it's one of the biggest challenges and struggles in business. I think that in my experience, this particular area of business is paramount. I never would have thought it in the beginning of my business years and through time, I never would have saw the significance of it, but in the end, it's the people who get you there. There are universal rules around attracting talent and keeping talent long term. And these rules are often overlooked by overcommitted business owners because we're all frazzled and dazed and hopefully at this point in the program, month 10, you're not anywhere near as frazzled and chaotic as you were. And you know what, right now might be a good time to think about that. Think to yourself, how is my life different now as compared to 10 months ago? Here you will learn about talent, compensation, finding talent, attracting talent, all those things that cause a lot of chaos in a business. When a key person leaves, I've been through it, I know what that can cause. And hopefully, as a result of this module, you'll have a lot uh, larger toolbox from which to pick your tools to deal with this problem. A lot of things we're going to teach you may seem like things you've heard before, but we're going to put it in a nice tight package. And I believe that companies don't even realize how much not understanding these principles has been holding you back in the past. Also for this module, the format's going to be a little bit different because we're going to be teaching applications through the module. I mean, we all understand the principle that's important to hire and attract talent, and we're going to talk a little bit abstractly about it, but really it's Rick's process that he uses in this realm that I think is so important. So there's not going to be a separate application. The whole module is basically the concept with the application. So let me start with the title of this module, the 5200% rule. What does that mean? Two decades ago, I heard about a study that was done in which a company looked at all of its employees and figured out that the bottom line difference in performance, the bottom line difference in performance between an average employee and a top employee was what percent? And when I speak publicly about this topic, I often will ask an audience, what percent Bottom line, what percent difference is there between an average employee and a number one employee? And hands go up and people say, oh, I don't know, 30%, 40%, 100%, 300%. But the most common answer is 30%. The, in reality, actually, the bottom line performance between an average employee and a top employee is 5,200%. And what we hope to do with this module is influence you in such a way that you see the power of this that you only want to seek out and hire and keep what I call the 5200 percenters. So this is a fun module and as Patrick said it will bring you bottom line results, it will reinforce the simplicity, probability and leverage of your business because it's always better to have great people. Always. And I'd like to talk maybe about a little personal experience where this became something uh, profound for me. I mean, I've been running businesses for over two decades now, so I, I have a very good sense of the importance of attracting and hiring and having the right talent in place, et cetera. And I've learned over time that I definitely am never looking for the best deal I can get on an employee. Oh, you know, can I get this one for a little bit less? No, I'd rather invest and have better talent around me. But the process of attracting and hiring and is something that was foreign to me. I never learned it in school. I maybe have read a book here or there or picked up some tips here or there, but I didn't have principles in place directly related to this process. And at a point in time when I was looking for a very high level key executive for my particular business, Rick, as a good accountability partner, which he is, said, hey, 
Um, I will uh, come up and I will uh, walk you through this process. So um, I literally had a guy that I had located who was in Chicago. We're on the East Coast, he's in Chicago. And he had a great resume, came with good recommendations, et cetera. And I was pretty excited about the prospect of hiring this guy. And I remember, and Rick will go through this, so I'm not going to get into details now, but he said, here's exactly what we're going to do. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, as far as getting out there, setting up the interview, how it's going to run, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember that probably we took a break during the interview, which was hours long. And as I walked out of the room, I'm excited. I'm like, God, this guy is just, he looks the part. He is the part. He's very impressive, et cetera. And I walk out the door, and no, no offense to him whatsoever, incidentally. I, you know, I still think he was a pretty able guy. I'm still in touch with him. He's succeeding in a new position. But walk out the door, and I'm talking to Rick on a break, and he just kind of looks down and he says, not the right guy for you. I'm like, not the right guy for me? What do you mean? I would have hired this guy in a second. He's like, not the right guy for you, and let me tell you why, X, Y, Z, et cetera. And as he's talking to me, I'm saying, yeah, you know, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, I didn't. My enthusiasm was having me overlook critical things that I wasn't seeing in the experience. And as he pointed these things out, I started to recognize these things on the resume, things that I was looking to have him do, the disconnect between those two things, how he was answering or not answering questions, et cetera. Again, not, that, not right or wrong, not good person, bad person. It was just a matter of what I was looking for, what I needed, how clear we were on that, and then looking at this person and recognizing not the right fit. So I can only imagine through a course of years of being in business, as you start to make hires and key hires, if you were to mishire, the cost of that to your career and to your business is almost incalculable. Uh, one study that, that we had uh, talked about on our accountability calls was that when you mishire a $70,000 person, a person whose annual salary would be $70,000, the cost of the company is estimated to be about a quarter million dollars. So basically, take whatever the annual salary is that you're going to pay a person and multiply it by almost four. And that's what the cost is if you don't do this right. So these principles and this process has to run from a front desk receptionist person, salespeople definitely, you know, if you're in a professional practice, you know, the people who assist you in that, no matter what business you're in, it should run from the lowest level to the highest level. And in my businesses, I don't run the process very much unless I'm hiring a very top level person. But the bottom line is that the process gets put in place. The way that you apply this gets put in place. And I have to tell you, there's nothing when you're a business owner, you're a business entrepreneur, there's nothing like the freedom of competent people who are properly aligned and incentive to do their job right, to make your life great, to give you freedom. And conversely, it's exactly true too, that people can make your life a living hell if they're not in the right position or if they're the wrong people that you hired to try to get something accomplished that they're just simply incapable of doing. And nothing demonstrates the word tuition like <laughs> this 5,200% rule. I have paid millions of dollars in tuition, and I want to teach you this so you don't have to pay any tuition yourself. And what I mean by that is millions of dollars of salaries over the years to the wrong people, to people that didn't fit the culture or the values, to people that were actually working against the culture. There was a study I read about in a newspaper recently that said, in a random poll of 10,000 employees, 60% of the people that took the poll were either completely disengaged from their job or partially disengaged with their job. That means they're actually working against your company. Only 40%, four out of 10 people, were fully engaged in their job. And that's them admitting it in the poll. What I mean is, it's probably a lot less than 40%, because the people that were doing this phone-based study didn't really know who was calling them. So think about that. 40% or less of the working population of employees is engaged in their job by their own word. So what do we want you to have? We want you to have fully engaged, happy employees that love promoting your business and love serving your customers. 
and think about it. We've talked about this in the past. Why does a company exist? I believe a company exists for one reason, to serve a customer. People say, well, a company exists to make a profit. No, because if you didn't have customers being served, you wouldn't have a profit. So you have to serve customers first, and then you have to incorporate all these foundational principles so that you can have a profit, so that you could have a place for great employees to work, so that you could create a long-term enduring enterprise. So let's get into this on a granular level so that you can start implementing this into your life immediately. So let's talk about hiring somebody. And we'll use the example because it's just an easy universal example someone that will be an administrator, administrative assistant to somebody else in your business. So it's a staff position, it's an important position because they're interfacing with customers in this, in this job that we're making up. So what I like to do first is on one sheet of paper, and we've got a sample of this in the implementation guide, on one sheet of paper, we want you to put what's called a job description. And the job description will say, here's what the attributes of the job are, here's what the ideal candidate looks like, values and maybe some background, and here's what the compensation uh, of the position is. So it's all on one sheet, maybe two. I refer to it as a one sheet. I've seen them a lot longer than one sheet, but ideally you wanna have one sheet. So that's step one. So a lot of times, this is very important to uh, say at this point, companies will not have a job description and here they are interviewing people, randomly uh, getting resumes in and the CEO or the hiring person will go meet somebody at Starbucks and they'll go through all these gyrations and activities. And that is not what you wanna do. That is the opposite of simplicity, probability and leverage. So what we want you to do is see this as a linear progression to you or for you to hire the ideal 5200 percenter. So we have an open position, which we've described. We have a job description, which we've laid out and you can see it in the implementation guide. And by the way, you could use that job description for any position, whether it's a CEO or any other position in the company, up or down. You could even use it for hiring vendors. I think there are multiple dimensions in the job description. One of which, of course, is skill set. What are the foundational skills this person needs to have? But the second one, which is a little bit more ethereal, is what is their attitude like? What's their disposition like? What type of a personality do they have? That's also very critical. You can have somebody with completely the right skill set, but the wrong disposition, or vice versa. I know, for example, that many times, uh, let's say in, a, in a, uh, an office, a doctor's office, uh, you might have a person at the front desk who is greeting people and somebody in the back who's billing insurance. And what might happen here? Well, if the person at the front desk is an analytical and doesn't have a you know, bubbly, expressive personality, uh, very neat, very detailed, very organized, but not a people person, and the person back billing insurance, even though they might have the skill set, is a bubbly personality, but not, you know, not really as detailed and neat in their disposition, suddenly now they both might have the skills to conduct the position but they don't have the right attributes as far as personality style and it's not like somebody's good or bad or right or wrong there are varying personality styles and you need to hire number one in the personality profile in my mind in the job description this is what you're looking for but number two also what's the skill set that you need thank you patrick so we start with the job description. Now I'm gonna give you a very linear way to secure a 5200 percenter. And what you wanna do is adapt this system to your company and your particular position. My main objective here, and our main objective with this module and with all these modules, is to have you think about your business in a new way, from a new perspective, so you can incorporate these rules and these processes into your business the way you want to maximize and leverage your business. All right, so now you've got your position description. The next thing you do is you create a list of at least 15 people, and the longer the list, the better, 15 influencers that you know that probably would know somebody to fill this position. And what you wanna to put together is an email, 
We have an example in the implementation guide, but again, I'm trying to spur your creativity. An email that goes to that person. So again, at least 15 people, and Patrick, you'd be on my list. And Patrick would get an email that says, Dear Pat, we are trying to find a new person who's a superstar A player for, to fill this particular role. Do you know anybody that's like the person attached in the job description? And just send the email out. And then what I do is I'll send that to at least 15 people, and then I'll follow up with a phone call. Now, a lot of times in today's day and age, you get voicemails, you get, you know, uh, you're leaving long messages, but I like to set a phone appointment, or the next time that I see Patrick, it'll be on my list, just like we taught you in a private module, to talk about it. And the conversation will go like something like this. Pat, as you know, I sent you that email. I'm looking for someone to fill the role of an administrative assistant. Do you know anybody like that? And he'll say, and this is very typical, he'll say, um, yeah, I got that email. Mm, I thought about it, I can't think of anybody. And I'll say, let's just wait. Why don't you just think about it right now? Let's do it right now because we're all busy today. We've got all kinds of distractions. Just think about it right now. And I'll just sit there. And in conversations like this, one minute seems like an hour, <laughs> but we'll just sit there. In about 30 seconds or 45 seconds in, or maybe a minute in, Patrick will say, there is this one person that I know that might be just right. And as soon as the floodgate opens where they think about that person, all of a sudden they think about another person and another person. And I've been in meetings like this where there was total silence for three minutes and I ended up getting five names. So the key here is you want to only go to people in your network that are solid that understand the difference between a good person and a mediocre person, and that could buy into your values. Oftentimes, if you ask the wrong person a question like this, their mind immediately goes to, uh, well, my sister's out of work, my neighbor's out of work, I've got this girl who desperately needs money because her husband uh, has been out of work, or this guy I know would be perfect, well, he's not in that industry, and they try to push their friends on you. You don't want that. You want to go to people that understand who you are, the type of business you aspire to be, and they're people that you can trust with their assessment of other people. Many times this could be a client within the business. It could be somebody that, you, that actually patronizes your business, and if you know the key people who are your best clients, they understand your business and they love and respect your business, so these are people that you might want to approach Again, you know, if they're patients, if they're clients, if they're members of a club, whatever it might be, whatever business, you know, that you're applying this to, it really just is a matter of saying that these people know the business and I have a good relationship with them and I would trust their judgment in understanding what I'm looking for because if it's somebody that's a good customer of your business and they'd want to see this person working there, uh, that's, that's at least somewhat of a good starting point. So now... I want to be crystal clear that you look at this in stages. Your first step is to create the position description. Your next step is to create a list of people that you trust that you're going to go to. Your next step is to send an email to everybody. What you don't want to do is collapse stages on top of each other. I've seen companies who are trying to hire a key employee and they're they're running ads over here, they got interviews happening over here, they're meeting their friends and family over here for coffee, they're meeting candidates uh, in in-person interviews. That is not going to add simplicity, probability, and success to your life. Implementing a system like this will. So again, to reiterate, you've got your job description, you've come up with the list of people that you're sending it to, you're now following up with the influential people that you sent it to. And the next step is very critical. You do not want to inter interview anybody or take the next step with anybody until you have at least X number of qualified resumes. And I have not talked about employment ads. We don't believe in that. The only way that I would use employment ads, and you could use a combination of some of these rules with employment ads, is if you're hiring a very, very low level person and you need lots of them. But what we're trying to do with the 5200% rule is use it for key positions in your company. And a lot of times an admin that's interfacing with your customers is a key position. 
I don't want you to look at this as, oh, that's a minor position. It's not a minor position. Harvey McKay, who's written a lot of books, has said the most important position in my company is the receptionist when people walk in. And I like to interview at least 100 people before I hire that person. Okay, so what I was about to say a moment ago is you want to have a number of qualified people that you want to bring into that uh, phase of the hiring process. I like to have at least 15 qualified resumes at a minimum for any position. Now, you may get 50 resumes, but you want to make sure 15 are qualified. What's a qualified resume? Well, when you look at the resume, it clearly has no gaps in it. There's no typos. All of the information that should be on a resume is there. I like to uh, see certain things on resumes that move people to the top rather than it saying references available on request. I love when someone says, here are my references. Here's their name, address, phone number, cell phone, uh, and email address right on the resume. That is somebody that really thought ahead. That's probably a 5,200 percenter. Why? Because nobody does it. References available on request on a resume, eh, everybody does that. Another thing I like to look for is somebody who's sensible enough in their resume to have it in at most two pages. Everybody, again, they're trying to find a job. It's a very competitive environment. People who don't realize, well, let me see how the employer is going to take my resume. So if they're going to take my, I want to make sure there's no typos. I want to make sure all my information is there. I want to make sure it's linear and there's no gaps. All the stuff that every resume writing book or course will tell you, if they don't have the basics, no matter how much you love them, get rid of that resume. Because here's what I believe in the hiring process. People walk around with a sandwich board on. Not literally, but figuratively. The sandwich board is a description of the attributes of that person. For example, if someone shows up for, uh, late for an interview or someone shows up late or misses a call, then they're the type of person that's not that organized. That's what their sandwich board is saying. You have to read the sandwich board. Just like Pat said earlier, your excitement and enthusiasm for the position when you're interviewing somebody is automatically transferred to them. And I've had this happen to me because I'm excited and it transfers to them. So when they're across from me, they're excited and they want the job. But the minute you walk out of the room, their excitement goes zzzz. You want to set up the hiring system so that they're generating. You want them to generate. And in the example of Patrick asking me to interview this executive, me and Patrick were generating so he was getting excited. When I put all the questions on him to see how he would generate, he fell flat. So it's very important, and you'll learn it in this module, to set up the system to see what people will do on their own. And so you're not propping them up, so to speak. Okay, so you've got your, your job description. Incidentally, uh, as Rick said, there'll be a sample job description, a one-cheater, you called it, in the implementation guide so you get a sense of what that looks like. You got your resumes in, and you have your own rules for sorting through the resumes, but I think what Rick just gave you are some pretty good stuff. I mean, it, you know, these little things can really mean a lot. So you've got that done now. You filter through the resumes. What's the next thing? Okay, so the next step is, let's say that your bare minimum is that you want 15 qualified resumes. So you got your 15 qualified resumes on a list. Now what we like to do at this point is send an email out to people that simply says, we've reviewed your resume, we like you for the position, or we'd like to consider you for the position, and I put a sample email in the implementation guide so you could see it. We'd like to consider you for a position. Please click on the link below to take a simple personality test. And there's so many personality tests available online. We use the predictive index there's a lot of different ones like Colby. You could Google out there. You could get really familiar with uh, one very basic test. The bottom line is not the results of the test. That's not the point here. The reason why we put it on the email is to see what people will do. An A player who's looking for a job, who submitted a resume, will be on top of their game. They'll be checking their email. They'll be doing what the email says. So. As you'll see in the email, it says, you're being considered for a position. 
please click on this link and take this 10 minute test. And please respond which time works for you to do a uh, phone based interview that will last about 30 minutes. And so you list some times like we have there in the implementation guide, which you'll see. Now, here's why we're doing this. A lot of employee potentials today, they can't follow simple, basic things. But, it's, but a 50%, 52 percenter will. They're going to read the email. They're going to do what the email says. So you want to have three steps in the email, three things for them to do. And see if they do all three. If they do two of them or none of them or they email you three days later, however they operate in the interviewing process is how they'll operate in your business. So it's giving you an opportunity to see how they're going to operate. So our uh, experience tells, that, tells us that if you're going to uh, try to find one person and you now have 15 qualified resumes, seven or eight will do what you ask them to do at this stage. So now, let's say that I end up with seven people. So now, what do I have here? I believe I have the cream of the crop. I've gone to my network with a job description. They've given me solid people. I've run them through the resume screening process, and now I've run them through this little test. Now I just have seven people. Counter that with how most people hire. They put a resume, uh, I'm sorry, job ad on the boards. They post it somewhere. They get hundreds of resumes. Many of them are crap. Now they've got to sift through the resumes, and they've got to take time out of their day. You hardly invested any time at this point in the candidates. You have invested in your network, but that's time that's not wasted and you don't feel like overwhelmed. So, so now you got seven resumes. And here's what I like to do with those seven resumes. Incidentally, it's worth pointing out that I've gotten it down to seven, but you could start with as big a pool as you want. When I was trying to hire a personal assistant, I actually wanted 60 resumes. So I wanted a lot of resumes. So in this example, we're starting with 15 and narrowing it down to seven. So now, uh, as, you, as we pointed out, you're going to have a phone interview. Why do you want to do a phone interview? In my opinion, here's why. You don't want to waste time. And having a phone interview gives you a lot of data points. It's unbelievable to me the number of high-level people that I've interviewed in my life who can't do a phone interview. They call while they're driving. They call on a bad cell phone from a bad area. Uh, the right person an A plus 52 percenter, if they know they have a phone interview, and by the way, put the onus on them to call you. Don't call them for a phone interview. Do they call at the right time? Does their voice come across crystal clear? Are they calling from a cell phone or a landline? Do you hear dogs and kids in the background? Again, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to find an A plus 5200 percenter. They're solid as a rock. You don't have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They show up on time. They speak clearly. They don't have the phone up. I've done phone interviews over a thousand times in my career. It's shocking how horrible a lot of people are when it comes to a phone interview. That's a good thing. They're giving you the data to get them out of the process. It's much more important what you say no to than what you say yes to. So now you've done a phone interview. You've talked to your seven people. Let's assume that five of them were good. Now you've got five people. Now I like to insert something really tricky into the process. Again, I haven't met anybody. I haven't wasted a lot of time. One thing that I like to do, depending on the position, is find a book or a report or a white paper or something and send it to them and say, give me your thoughts, please, on this particular uh, book or article or whatever. When it comes to hiring my personal assistant, I sent them an Amazon link to the book Managing Up, which was written by Roseanne Bedowski, which is Jack Welch's assistant. And I said, write a report on this book. Now, if I'm trying to hire somebody as critical in my life as a lifetime assistant, they better be able to go on Amazon, buy a book, read the book, buy a book report, and send it in. I hope you're saying to yourself, wow, that makes so much sense. Of course, you want to see if they're going to do the things before you waste time hiring somebody and bringing them in, into your life and going through hours and hours of interviews. So 
in the process of hiring an admin assistant that we're talking about here, not a lifetime assistant, I'm going back to uh, the model here, uh, you want to insert something into the process so they have to stop, think, and you could see what they'll uh, do in action, in real time. So we put a sample of, a, of an email that we sent out so you could see the progression. And now let's say you get three emails back. So again, we're hiring an admin person. Now you've got three. You're down to three. Three that you like. They've got the right reference. They've done phenomenal on responding to the emails in the proper order. You, they did their test. I'm not that concerned with the test results. Again, we're just trying to find out if they can follow directions. So don't worry. What's that test that he said? It's just important to insert a step. Then. Uh, they responded to the request for information, whether it's a book report or reading a report or doing something. And now you're down to the final three candidates. So what do you do? I suggest that you have at least three in-person interactions. And we, we have some examples in the implementation guide, but the three I like to have are, and again, I wanna make sure that you do this all in steps. So, I would encourage you to interview these three people in this example, this same day, one after the other. Always have at least two people present in the interview, and the first one you want to be about an hour long. Your objective here is to compare the candidates against each other, and your objective here is, are they showing up on time? Do they seem like the right person? Do they fit the values of your business? Make sure when you're interviewing someone, too, that you're not doing two things that need to be separated. One thing is telling somebody about your company. So you're kind of selling them on the business and telling them about it. Another thing is gathering data. All too often when people are interviewing, they're not asking questions of the candidate. They're just saying, we do this and we do that and our company exists to do this. And our no, you have to make sure you cover that piece, telling people about your company, but you switch over to the other piece, which is asking them, what are your values? Why do you want this job? What research did you do on the company? And you're observing them. I never hire somebody who comes to an interview without a pen, without a piece of paper, without a copy of their resume. If they can't think ahead enough, and add these to your rules, to bring a resume, pen, and paper to the interview, they're not going to make a good employee most of the time. Why am I saying that? Because think about you. You're about to go to a company, you're about to do an interview. What if somebody new comes to the table and they haven't seen my resume? You want people that could think ahead, that have the ability to think in terms of scenarios because they're gonna have to think ahead in your company. But what most people do that are interviewing or doing the interviewing inside your business, they go, ah, they probably forgot, no big deal. You don't wanna do that. People are interviewing and they're giving you an opportunity to see them naked in a sense. So if they're coming to an interview without their resume, without something to write on, and without a, a pad and paper, I mean, think about it. Think about that. So I'm just giving you some basic examples. I want you to think of more examples, add it to your rules when you're hiring, and put that into your company's memory banks. I don't want to confuse you here with a lot of data. As I said, the implementation guide will make it more straightforward for you. But now your three people all come and you decide that you're gonna move forward with two. So you had your one in-person interview. I told you to have at least three in-person interactions. At that point, what I like to do is set up an opportunity to have them in a social setting. Maybe you have lunch, maybe you have dinner, maybe, maybe now is a good chance to meet their spouse. And you wanna make it very serious, but you wanna see them as, in as many interactions as you can, but at a minimum of three. So the three candidates that you met, you're gonna narrow it down to two and you're gonna take it to the next step with the two, maybe over lunch, whatever. I put in the implementation guide some questions that you could ask in that interaction. Let's say in that second in-person interaction, you now narrow it down to the final candidate. You don't wanna waste the last interview on too many people. You wanna do it with one, two, maybe three. This is the final interview. This is the long form interview that could last two or three hours. I've had people ask, how could you sit for two or three hours with a candidate? 
And those very same people will waste three days of their life interviewing dozens of people, and they're all the wrong people, but they won't spend two or three hours interviewing the final candidate or the final two candidates. The final interview has a lot of questions. And what you want to do is try to find out the patterns that they've formed in their life. You want to go all the way back to the beginning. How do you learn? Tell me some mentors that you had as a ch child. What were your values growing up? Tell us about yourself and how you come to conclusions. You start at the very beginning. All those questions are there. If you live in a state where some questions violate state or federal laws, that you don't want to ask those questions, please consult with an attorney on all of this so that you're not violating any laws. What we've done is we've put questions together to spur your thinking so you can create your own set of questions to ask. The important thing here is that you're finding the best candidates that value the values of your business and have the highest probability of performing in your work environment. You know, one of the, uh, just as we're talking about the questions and you're going to have them there, but one of the questions, and there are several, and, and I've been through this two to three hour interview process with two people, you know, that are in the interview process, as Rick is going to explain in a moment, an interviewer and an observer, note taker. Um, and one of the things that I thought was a great question that told me a lot about the person was, okay, going back through the job history, there's a rhythm, you know, four different questions about every job, actually back to even their childhood, are they picking up on the rhythm and they're kind of anticipating you at this point, that's a sign of a winner versus somebody who's just sudden, somehow just not getting and not tracking. But one of the questions was, okay, looking at who is your boss at XYZ job? If I were to talk to that person today, what would they tell me about you? And I w I'm surprised at the stuff that came out of that. You know, in other words, suddenly it's kind of like if they, if they give you, they look you in the eye and say, they tell me this, 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 and this. And you can tell if it's genuine and if it's impactful. And again, not right or wrong, just is it genuine? And is it aligned with what you're looking for? That's great. And, but many times, fortunately, people would say, well, you know, I had a problem at that job with this person who was my boss. They would probably say this about me. And you might look at that as a virtue as far as saying, okay, well, that's okay. That, that problem wasn't, wouldn't be a problem with me. Or you might look at it saying, well, if they're willing to admit this in an interview, you know, they're already saving me the trouble of having to call up that boss. You know, the things emerged that I never, I mean, my, probably before I met Rick and I learned this process, my longest interview was maybe 30, 40 minutes, maybe 30 or 40 minutes, sometimes maybe a little longer. And now to sit through a two, really closer to three hour plus interview, which I've been in multiple ones of those now, I really have seen that uh, this is an effective process, again, in the way that he'll explain it in just a moment. One other thing I'll tell you, just a recent experience, as we go back to the last module related to this, um, is that I have now rules around my hiring. And uh, my last hire that I actually did the interview process with, I, and I knew the candidate from around long before I hired him. I've known him for a lot of years. But I, I went through the exact same process with this candidate as I would with any candidate, uh, even though I knew the person. I didn't, I didn't circumvent the process, saying, I already know this person. I don't need to do this. I went through the process, and I broke a rule. And I actually, when I got done and I, and I hired this person, I said, you know, I'm breaking one of my rules to hire you. And the rule was, this person hadn't done the same hadn't stayed at the same job for more than a year to a year and a half in the past 10 years. So I'm looking for somebody that was more long term, somebody who's going to have more stability, somebody who's going to stick with it, somebody who's going to grow in a position. And this person had all the attributes and then some for the position that we were hiring for. And I like the person, but that was that one thing that I said, in this case, I'm going to break my rule because I think the other things were so great that it's worth breaking this rule for. And I told the person this when I hired him, well, lo and behold, they were here for, you know, guess what, a year and a half or so. And no bad feelings. I knew why, eyes wide open going in that this was a, you know, a possibility, maybe even a probability. But I guess I'm expressing how it's important to not only do the process, but have rules along the way that guide you so you don't make mistakes. And I think it's OK if you have a rule to enforce the rule knowing that you might on occasion have a good person slip through the, uh, or not be hired, okay, than it is to break your rules and have a bad person slip through. Let me repeat that. 
It's more important to enforce your rules and occasionally have someone like in this example, yeah. if Pat would have enforced the rule, he would have never gone through all the mental gyrations of bringing someone into your business, which is like a marriage, and then them leaving. He said no big deal, but it's always a big deal because it's very expensive to have to replace somebody. So if you really want to dig down on this topic really deep, there's a book called Top Grading, and there's a lot of workbooks and things like that if you really want to dip, dig down. We're giving you the basics so that you're going to get 90% of the way there. And a lot of companies that I've instituted these rules, what you're learning now, have gotten uh, much further and bigger and have a lot higher probability of success. So some of you are very granular and you want to dig deep so you can do that uh, by learning about top grading. I want to also talk about something else that uh, a lot of people are reluctant to uh, talk about when it comes to hiring. When you bring people on the interview process, it's important to get them to sign a document that says, we will be doing a background check on you. We will be checking your credit history, your criminal history. We'll be checking where you went to school. We'll be checking your whole background. Please sign this document that authorizes us to do this check. Because a lot of people, uh, they're like, well, is it, is it OK to check somebody's credit history? Of course it is, if they give you their signature that says they're OK with it. So in the implementation guide, I added the form that we use to allow you to check somebody's credit and check their background. You want them to sign off on that. And you only want to do that with people in the final stages of the process. Another thing, and I'm shifting gears here, I was influenced by Michael Eisner, who used to run Disney. I don't know him. But I know that he went through life, and he, he often hired people from the most bizarre places because he was always on the lookout for those 5,200 percenters. I want you, and you'll see it in the implementation guide, I want you to keep a bench. And that is through the course of your life, whether you're in church or you're at the gym or you're in a nice restaurant or you're anywhere, from time to time, once a month, twice a month, once a year, depending on how many people you interact with, you're going to come across a superstar, a 5,200 percenter. Those 5,200 percenters oftentimes interact with your business already. They're people that are clients or vendors or whatever. Keep a bench of superstars. And you always want to have about 30 or 40 people on that bench. So when a position opens up, if there's people on that bench that have the qualifications for that position, you don't always have to go to your network. And my bench right now has about 40 people on it. It's incredibly important for you to start a bench right now as a result of this module and be on the lookout for quality people. It's very interesting that we're trying to help you illuminate areas of your life, shine light on that, on those areas that you may not have ever shined light on before. And this is one of them, attracting talent and you track talent by doing all of the modules in the right way, management by objectives, having a purpose for your business. All of the things will help you attract talent. Having a clear focus for your business. At the end of the day, you want to attract employees that fully align with your business, that understand your business's purpose and catalyzing statement, that want to work in a system that understands management by objectives, that wants to work in a system that values them. And so this all works together. The final thing I want to talk about is when you are interviewing someone in a formal interview process, it's critically important, in my opinion, to have one person in the interview process that asks the questions and one person that's an observer and they just take notes. Because when you're interviewing, you want to be focused on the flow of the conversation and pick up on social cues. It's very hard to do that and take notes at the same time. And you simply explain to the person that you're interviewing, I'm going to be asking the questions and interacting with you, and Patrick over here is going to be taking notes. And the great thing about that is, at the end of the interview, you could collaborate. What did you think? It's, in, it, it's often that I see, as the person asking the questions, I get a completely different perspective than when I'm the person taking the notes. 
and I've done both roles, and you definitely want to have that. In every interview that someone has with your company, you always want to have at least two people. And that sends a message to the person on the other side of the table that your company is thorough and organized and really is concerned with having quality people. I've often heard when I'm interviewing people, wow, you guys are really thorough. I don't know if I want to work for a company like this. <laughs> Don't you want somebody that <laughs> values the fact that you're taking so much time to do it right and find the right person? People will give you cues to get them off the boat and take those cues. And that's incidentally, um, the person who does end up being the winning candidate, they feel really good about the fact that they worked, literally worked hard to get the position. So it kind of raises their own self-image and esteem and they bring more to the table. The other thing about having two people at the table that I've noticed also is it puts more pressure on the candidate because it's kind of a two-on-one. Mm -hmm. And you want to see that there's people who could stand up under that, that they've got the, basically the inner strength to be able to sit at a table with two people and, and answer questions. So it's a, it's a little bit more intimidating, but you want to see people with pressure on them to see how they're going to perform, and that's going to tell you a lot about their character. So I think that's important. And you know, the thing I just want to kind of bring to light here to maybe to add a little more texture to it is when we did the interview that we referred to earlier out in Chicago, I mean, Rick was like, okay, we want to get exactly this type. We're at a hotel. We're going to have exactly this kind of a meeting room. Um, we walked into the meeting room an hour, maybe an hour and a half before the interview started, and he rearranged the whole room. He said, no, this isn't the right setup. I want these tables right dead center in the middle of the room. I want to clear everything else out. I want a tablecloth across these both tables. I want two pads on one side, one pad on the other, the angles of the pen were a certain way, the pitcher of water. I mean, he literally took so much time to detail out just the vibe and the feeling of the room and the setup of the room. And it taught me something just watching this process as far as literally saying, look how serious we are about this. This isn't you know, a time for fun and games and, and you know, joking around. We are on track to literally pay somebody potentially the highest respect that we can pay an individual. The highest compliment I could give to an individual is say, I want you to work in my company. I can't give anybody a higher compliment than that. And I want that person to feel that way, to say, we're serious about this. We take this seriously and that we only add team members into the organization who will respect how important the people are in the organization. And uh, I, I think that was an you know, important like, little detail or texture to how this thing goes. So in your case, you know, if you're going to be interviewing within your own business, still set it up in a room. I mean, we have a uh, you know, pretty large space in our operation. And I have a conference room. I have my own private office, which has got ample space. But the last interviews I've been doing, we also have a big training area. As a matter of fact, we're standing in it right now. And we, have, uh, we can put up to 50 people in there classroom style and train people in there. But what we did is we took you know, two of the tables that normally would be the classroom tables, put them with each other, cleared out a space, put a tablecloth across them, and set up the whole thing. So they walk into a big room and they see, wow, there's a special setup just for this interview. And that, that just communicates everything without a word. We want you to realize that we're trying to condense a lot of information into one hour or less so you could have the most impact in a short period of time. But the most important thing that we would like you to derive from this module is that you create your own process to bring people on. We've whetted your appetite, so to speak, used the rules-based decision-making from the prior module to help formulate your plan for hiring. But as Patrick pointed out, you want to create a system and an environment and a process so that the right candidates emerge out of that process. You don't want to try to uh, fit people in. Well, it's okay, we'll overlook this and overlook that. So it's critically important that you set your system up so that the right person for you, the 5200 percenter for your company, will emerge from the process. And with that, I'd like to wrap up right now. Did you want to add I've something? I've got one more thing I've got to add. OK. It's, it's a tip that you gave me, and you were 100% right. He, he probably doesn't even remember half his tips. He's got so many. So one of the things he said, which I agree, is that whenever you have the right person, you remember saying this? Halfway through the interview, you feel like you just want to stand up and hug them. 
He said, if you're halfway through an interview, you're an hour, hour and a half in, and you don't want to stand up and hug this person saying you're perfect, they're probably not the right person. You remember telling me that? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's you know, just another little tip. You get, you get a vibe on it. You get a sense of it. If you get to the end of those three hours of interviewing somebody, and at that point, you're still trying to figure out do they fit or not, it's probably not the right person. Your gut's telling you no. You know you got the right one when you're, like, you're partway in and you're like, I just want to stand up right now and interview and hug this person. So I, I think that that's you know, a very good tip. So you get the vibe on this. I mean, it's not just a black and white left brain regimental thing. There's a gut feel side. There's you know, definitely the right brain side of this. And you get better and better at it every time you, know, you, you go through the process. And I will tell you this further. I used to dread hiring people. I used to probably dread hiring people as much as I dreaded firing them, only because it's like, oh, I got to go through this whole process, and I got to you know, do this and this, and I don't know if they're right or wrong. And, you know, and I, I would, when you dread doing something, you don't do it very well. This made it fun for me. It's intense. I mean, me, there's a lot of work and a lot of detail, but the concept of saying, I've got a new opportunity here. I can bring somebody in that can really deliver, really make my life great, really help the business. You know, I get excited when we have the opportunity to hire. So I would love for you to have that excitement also and hire the 5,200 percenters because it's the difference between a business that just gets along and a business that succeeds on the ultimate levels. So thanks for that final tip, Patrick. Have a great time with this implementation guide. We're glad you're in this program, and we're excited to see the effects of what happens in your business when you apply these principles. Thank you for watching this module of Business Finishing School. Let your business brain finish what your entrepreneurial heart started.